So this is A plus uh, version. Episode four. four. Episode yeah. version four. Episode four, of course. <laughs> Michael Apple, good to have you uh, in our studio. I'm Alec Hogg. There's Michael Mike. Apple, hi. And we are going to be talking about some interesting stuff today. I've got on the investment side, business side, uh, I had interviews with Sean Pesh and Pete Fulion in the past week, two of the most popular market commentators that we have among the business news community. Mm-hmm. Sean's based in London. He's with Randmore Funds, and he spoke about uh, Netflix, which has been the big disaster of mm-hmm. the past week, and we'll unpack a little bit on that. And then Pit Fulion spoke about the biggest stock listed on the JAC, which is NicePass, which has spent hundreds of millions of dollars doing something that's been an abject failure. I'll also be talking about something that may be an abject failure as well in some people's eyes, and that's Cape Independence, who are having a march on Wednesday down uh, the city of Cape Town. I look on the news and politics side of things. Uh, Valise Spies, this is a... A, an aspect of news that hasn't really been picked up by uh, our colleagues out there. And this is kind of the David versus Goliath story of Pretoria FM um, having to defend its claim to service the Afrikaner community against um, continual litigation from Prime Media Broadcasting, litigation that spanned about two decades. So uh, Two sp- decades? Two decades. Yo. So, so I spoke to Willie Spies, who's the executive chairman of Pretoria FM, um, then to a story that continues to be in the news, obviously, KwaZulu Natal floods, the death toll went up there. It went from a provincial state of disaster now to a national state of disaster. Um, so Cyril Ramaphosa, we'll be hearing from him a little bit later, uh, and we'll just dissect what he had to say to the nation. And then Paul O'Sullivan, the forensic investigator, uh, a household name in South Africa for somebody who's not afraid to take on the scumbags of South Africa and abroad. Um, he's got a new book out. You would know since you were there. We'll, <laughs> we'll be discussing Paul, o- Paul O'Sullivan's new book, Alec. He's got, I think, three bullets in his body that they couldn't extract. I don't know how many times he's been shot. But he said this year alone... Uh, there have been seven attempts on his life. I think he said seven attempts in the last five years. Five years, okay. Yeah. Well, Paul, yeah. something else. But uh, that's going to be a good conversation. Let's uh, kick off, though, with the Netflix story. And it's quite relevant to us here at Biz News. We run two portfolios, which are really not – I'm not a money manager, but they are model portfolios so that members of the Biz News community can have a look at some stocks – and then decide whether or not to invest in them in the proportions that we invest. Now, we've done very, very well on the global portfolio, what we now call the web trader portfolio, which has been going for seven and a half years. It started off at about two, just over two million rand, and it's now sitting at about 10 million rand. So it's done incredibly well. And then in December, we launched the shift portfolio for smaller portfolios. People who hadn't been invested in the major portfolio over this period, they could now start again. And the shift portfolio or the business shift portfolio is you can manage it on your cell phone. It started with a $10,000 uh, lump sum, and it's easy enough to be able to replicate that for most of our community members. In both of those portfolios, one of our banker stocks is Netflix. Mm. And Netflix has had a awful couple of Hammering. Days. Well, just to put it in context, what we bought it for in the shift portfolio is now worth half. So so we bought, but this is also a good thing about diversification. Although it's one of our bankers, uh, in the shift portfolio, we've gone $10,000, $10,000, $10,000 over three months, the purchases. There's just over $4,000 of that in total, of the $30,000 in total, was invested into Netflix. That's now worth $2,000. So it's down by half. And the story about Netflix is that it has been what we call an exponential share, an exponential company. Exponential companies are those that grow 20% plus. It started not growing at 20% with a f- set of financial results that came out in January. Mm. And quite a few people panicked. The share price dropped 25% as it happens just after we bought it. The day before, uh, we bought it in the shift portfolio and then it dropped. And now three months later, the set of results that came out this week was far worse than had been projected in January, which caused the 25% share price drop. So it's almost like, look, here's the bad news. 
Um, but you hope that they gain, it's going to prove to be conservative and that the news is going to be much better when they finally bring the numbers out. It went the other way around. Instead of an 8% growth in their subscriber numbers, their n- subscribers went down. 200,000. 200,000 right, right? on a on a quantum of 150 or 60 million is not really that much when you you look at it that but it's the trend that's critical if you're an exponential company you and you get a rating as an exponential company you've got to grow but you, you can't you can't grow in perpetuity though there are exactly. only so many people that can watch netflix and uh with how tight people's purses have gotten you're gonna have to start making decisions and is this a reflection of the rising cost of living energy costs or is it just that there are so many more options out there the netflix story was always that they are going into a market that's dominated by the network television mm-hmm. companies yeah. they're giving you consumption on demand rather than appointment consumption what that means is if if you with network tv companies you have to go on and watch at a particular time on demand you can take any time you want to you can stream it and that was the story that they could get to 7 billion people on the planet. So almost uh, plenty of road with which they could still grow. However, competitors have been coming into it at a rate of knots. Apple TV are doing a wonderful job. Disney Uh, Plus uh, is in there. There we go. Uh, Amazon also. And as these come in, and HBO is, is also, I mean, it's the market leader in that area. As they come more and more into the space that Netflix has, Netflix has said, we're not worried about them, and I think I bought the story and many other people did, because we are actually attacking network TV. But that's being shown to have been a little bit of a a naive assessment because the competition is now starting to affect Netflix. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, we heard from Netflix's CEO and founder, uh, Reed Hastings, that they are worried because for every one Netflix account that exists, there are at least two others who are using the same passwords and they haven't got that, they haven't addressed that. So there's, there's a lot of stuff and now they're talking about uh, having a advertising driven option on Netflix. So it's, it's like the, the, the strategy which was crystal clear has become confused mm. and as a consequence of that um, in the pre-trading, uh, after, the, after the financial results came out for the, sec- for the first three months of this year, they were so bad that after uh, the, the indicative share price for the next day's trade, because they came out after the market had closed, was a 25% decline. In fact, when the market opened, they went down 35%. Yeah. So it's been a, a wipeout of monumental proportions. And the reason that this is important is not just because of Netflix, but because of what could happen to other companies that are coming through. And I think... Sean Pesh actually touched on something that not too many people have been aware of. And let's just listen to that clip on what Sean had to say. It's a very small part of a fascinating interview, which, of course, is on BizNews TV. The big week is next week. The big week. And I worry there are a couple of things that Netflix is showing us and Johnson & Johnson have shown us. And the one thing that us South Africans understand that the U.S. investors don't are currencies. If you're living in the the dollar, you've never really worried about currencies. Us living with Iran's, we worry about currencies. And the dollar has been really strong. Look at the yen. I think it's down 20-something percent over the last year. So I think it's a challenge. And I think earnings for for the U.S., for many U.S. multinationals, are going to be quite pressured. And I think we started to see that with Netflix and Johnson & Johnson. Now, what's important here is you talk about U.S. multinationals, and they've got businesses all over the world. In the past, they never really worried if the dollar figure, uh, because it didn't move that much. We used to volatility in the rand, as Sean said. But now imagine yourself, you're an Apple, and you're selling a lot of iPhones into Europe, and your value that you're reporting in, in dollars, and that you're paying dividends in in dollars, is actually going to be knocked by 15%, because that's how much the euro has declined by against the uh, US dollar. So suddenly your numbers start looking very different because of the currency movements. And that's what Sean's saying. He said, watch out next week when these quarterly results come out from Apple, Amazon, uh, Alphabet, which is a holding company of Google, Facebook, etc. Because those numbers could be 
could be a shock and netflix could be just the start of it look please god it isn't it isn't uh, they don't all make a shock well tesla came out with their results and they shot the lights out yeah uh, so that was good news and uh, the tesla share price has gone up as a result but it's interesting in this investment world especially when you're investing in u.s companies is that they report every three months and so you can get an update every three months and and that's what makes investing in shares particularly global shares so interesting well alec let's move on to uh, a story that i that came out on on biznews.com yesterday and i just want to use this opportunity to uh, put put out a little bit of a call to action to please go and subscribe um, to our youtube channel to biznews.com to the tv channel and also hit the bell notification that means you're going to get um, a message on your phone every time the Biz News publishes new content. You're going to be kept up to date. Um, so show the finger. <laughs> hit the bell wherever <laughs> there it, is. it is down the bottom. I mean, we see all these YouTube videos, and the guys are saying this: "Look down, look down. There it is. Uh, click subscribe. Click yeah. the bell." And we've never done it before. But anyway, thank you, Mike. There we go. If you can't plug your own show, what can you plug? Um, all right, on to um, an attorney and also the chairperson of Pretoria FM, Valise Spies. Uh, this is an interesting story. Now, Alec, you have a lot of experience in the radio industry, I, uh, to a much lesser degree. Um, the Complaints and Compliance Committee of ICASA uh, recently dismissed... That's the regulator. That's the regulator. Mm -hmm. Dismissed complaints against Pretoria FM, which is a, a small... Um, community-based radio station which is licensed to serve the interests of the Afrikaner community in South Africa. Now the Afrikaner community is spread out geographically across the country and as Vili Spies explained it to me and uh, we're going to hear from him a little bit later, uh, Prime Media has been litigating against them to some degree or another <laughs> since at least 2004 this is a channel that was established in a station that was established in 1993 and they've pretty much been facing an uphill battle ever since and nine different court cases over about two decades i actually said to him you know your guys litigation is starting to rival jacob zuma's as it's been dragged through the courts from the high courts to the supreme court of appeal to the constitutional court Vili Spies explaining that hopefully the litigation has now been put to bed as ICASA through um, a judge, retired judge. And I saw this name and it reminded me of my reporting years a couple of years ago. Tokazili Masipa, does it? Oh, yes, it rings a bell for that, sure. That was from Oscar Pistorius's murder yes. trial. That's oh. where Tokazili Masipa. Madam Justice. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So she was the retired High Court judge who, who ruled and dismissed Prime Media's claims um, against uh, Pretoria FM. Now, I need to get this right. Basically, one of the complaints, uh, there was a host of complaints. It wasn't one case. So if they didn't succeed on one, they would try on a different. So one of the complaints was that, according to your license, if you are a community radio station, you can only syndicate 20% of your content can go to another, let's call it a sister station or, or so on. So a community radio station needs to be able to stand on its own feet, produce 80% of its own content and 20% may come from another station. Now the complaint is that Pretoria FM has been sending 100% of its content to affiliates. It calls it an, an affiliate agreement. It casts us aware of it. When they applied for their license, they knew that there were stations that were 100% dependent on Pretoria FM for the content. And they're, they're upfront about it. They don't try to hide it. We give 100% of our content to our affiliates. That upset the apple basket, excuse the pun, and um, Prime Media and Kajiso, who together own about 60% of the, the ad market that's in that uh, uh, radio broadcast market. It seems that the small station, Pretoria FM, that started to serve its listeners, it, its community, if you will, it's, it started to take bites out of that 60% and started to eat into the profits of some of the bigger players in the market. And this upset them. So I asked Vili Spies, uh, whose voice you'll hear now, 
um, just how he feels about a, a broadcast market in which you have two very dominant players and the role that Pretoria FM is trying to play. The broadcasting scenery is not enriched by what has been done. It's, it's impoverished by what has been done. And that's why we fought it. Fortunately enough for us, um, my first reaction was that Prime Media tried to kill us. But in trying to kill us, they actually made us stronger. We believe there's room for everyone. And we need to see that the room for everyone is being nurtured in a way that there shouldn't be only two successful commercial radio companies. We need to make sure that it is not captured by one or two dominant players in the commercial field. There are a couple of things on this. First of all, it's an excellent interview. And I think that uh, well done to you, Mark. You, you told the story, Vili told the story uh, that is compelling. The second thing is, if it wasn't the 20% uh, rule, Prime Media and Kahisa would have found something else to litigate on. They've been going at it for, as you say, nearly two decades. And if this isn't a reputational risk to these very high and mighty radio stations, they try to project this image of being the arbiters of truth in our society. And yet, you can't get more ugly uh, than the ugly face of capitalism than what's going on here. Here are these huge monopolies, legislated monopolies, who are trying to enforce their monopolistic uh, benefits by attacking a little community station. So the morals just stink. The ethics stink. And I think that, the, the to me, Prime Media and Kahiso need to bl- stop this nonsense. They came at us, uh, so I have, a, I have an insight into this, when we helped a little radio station called Radio Today, broadcasting on AM, 1485 AM in Johannesburg. So really, an audience that is absolutely tiny, minuscule. And we were helping them. They were going bankrupt. And they launched a campaign, the big radio stations, to get our company out of assisting this little radio station because they maintained that rules are rules and, uh, you know, let these guys rather go to the wall. After putting quite a lot of support into it and having one of the leading advocates in South Africa uh, coming against us, Gilbert Marcus, shame on him too, we decided that uh, the late, in fact they're both late now, Peter Lotus and Dr. Ivan May uh, and ourselves decided there was no point in continuing with this, uh, this fight. It was impossible for us. So I've been there, done that, and seen what Vili Spies and Pretoria FM have done and I'm just so full of admiration because from a business perspective, fighting against these giants, little David going in there, having to fight Goliath in Goliath's battlefield, which is what has occurred, and then doing it for nearly 20 years and the costs of the leg- yep. legal system in South Africa. So well done in exposing this. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, there's another story in this one with little LM Radio. Well, I wanted to just update those who are listening. So Prime Media hasn't just litigated against Pretoria FM. This is not an isolated incident. You've just told your side of that. Uh, Prime Media has also litigated um, and laid complaints against a host of other stations, Hot 102.7 FM, Mix FM, and then Lorenzo Marx Radio, LM Radio. Um, And it, as as Valispis says there, it, it hasn't enriched, it has impoverished and He certainly uh, is standing up very strongly against um, a monopolistic attitude that uh, appears to have taken hold in the broadcast industry. Mike, I I have um, engaged with quite a lot of media owners in other parts of the continent, and they cannot believe how South Africa's radio licenses have been managed, that it's almost like ICASA is, is rewarding cadres. Uh, in that they are restricting the number of radio licenses here, legislating for massive profitability. And for those who understand business, when you get an EBITDA margin, profit margin, in other words, of 50% plus, which is what South African radio stations have been earning, that is, ex- it's exorbitant. It, you don't, it's five times what a reasonably run radio station elsewhere in the world would get. And it's being being uh, perpetuated by using this excess profit to tackle anyone who looks vaguely like competition. And my hope is that after this uh, ruling, which now 
enables uh, Pretoria FM to get on with its lives, with its life, it's never going to be a threat to Prime Media or to Kahisa. But after this, that the boards of Prime Media and Kahisa look at it and say, whoa, hang on, the reputational risk of what we're doing, acting like these bullies, we're not acting, being bullies against the, the emerging uh, operations is actually just too high. Let's stop this nonsense now and uh, let's rather compete on a, on a fair basis and let our product show that we are better rather than trying to squash everybody else who's around. Anyway, it's a very personal thing for me. I've been in that industry Why don't you tell us time. what you really think, <laughs> Alec? <laughs> a great story. Yeah. Okay, nice bat. Uh, yeah, nice bat. Uh, South Africa's dominant media company by miles, uh, the biggest share listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the nice pass process lot. So pretty much every pensioner in this country has got some, well, exposure, pensioner, yeah. anybody who's investing uh, in shares has got some exposure to nice pass and process. So it's very, very important to us. Around two years ago, they embarked on, an op- on, a, on a process of reducing the, the discount. So it can be a bit technical, but I'll, I'll unpack it very briefly. NicePass owns around 30% of Tencent, which is one of the great internet companies in the world. That 30% is worth a premium to what you buy for NicePass shares. So you buy, you pay 100 for a NicePass share, you're going to be, uh, if, if NicePass were not there anymore and you just took the Tencent portion you would get back, uh, depending on, on where the premium goes, say 130, 140. Uh, so everything else in NASPERS is actually worth nothing. You are trading, NASPERS shares are trading at a discount to what the 10 cent share is. Or I won't say nothing, you're getting it for free as a mm-hmm. shareholder. Mm-hmm. Now, a couple of years ago. They the, tried to reduce that 30% yeah, discount. They made it a strategic imperative that they would reduce the discount that existed between what NASPERS shareholders' value was in the share price and the underlying uh, value through Tencent. And Pete Fulion gives us a a good insight to this before we go. Uh, Let's have a listen to him before we go more deeply into the story and and what occurred next. At that time, uh, management came out and said their priority over the next few years is to close that discount. That's a very expensive exercise. Investment bankers have benefited from it tremendously to create a new holding company in an offshore jurisdiction, transfer a lot of assets to that company, and then create intercompany investments across, across shareholdings. So I, I think it's cost NASPA shareholders a bomb to do this. It, I, I would say hundreds of millions of dollars, yes. Okay, so let's, let's just pause there. Hundreds of millions of dollars to reduce the discount. To create process. It's what created process. It created process which was supposed to reduce the discount. So everything, the strategy was reduce the discount. That discount is now gone even worse and it's at a record 62%. 62, yeah. And Peter's saying, why spend all this money, hundreds of millions of dollars, on a terribly failed plan? And part of the reason, he says, is the executives of NASPAS are incentivized not on reducing that discount, but they incentivized on other things, primarily on the share price of ten cent, over which they have got no control whatsoever. So it's a it's it's really a very important story. South African asset managers a couple of years ago went to nice Pass and said, instead of doing all this stuff, just unbundle, just unbundle your ten cent. Explain what unbundling is. Well. The easiest way for a NASPAS shareholder uh, to, or for NASPAS shares to shoot through the ceiling is if NASPAS were to announce that its shares in Tencent were to be distributed amongst the shareholders of NASPAS. So at the moment, uh, say you have 100 NASPAS shares, you might get 300 Tencent shares, and that would be, or the Tencent shares alone would be worth more than your whole NASPAS shares at the moment. So You'd get you'd, the share price would go up, and you'd still have the nice pass um, rump. You know, the the newspapers in South Africa, uh, shareholdings in some of the bets that they've made internationally, which may or may not turn out. So far, not looking so good. They went into delivery in a big, big way. They almost bought a company in the UK called Just Eat, and that whole 
they, they were in a bidding war. They lost the bidding war. And the guys who won the bidding war are now left with a poison chalice because they're having to unwind their own business because it's been such a disaster. So it, it doesn't, and I suppose we're real lucky that they didn't get Just Eat because da Just Eat has turned out to be, well, nowhere near as, as good as uh, NASPAS had thought. So what investors are saying is that the management of NASPAS are destroying value. They're destroying our shareholder value. But w what makes this even more complicated is that NASPAS is controlled by voting shares that are not listed on the stock market. So the controlling shareholders, Kurs Becker and others, who have created all this value in the first place, are making the decisions uh, against a, a, a nation of shareholders. And this is where that conflict comes in. You, you've got to feel a lot of sympathy for Kurs, because had Kurs not done the very bold moves of investing in Tencent when it was only 35 people and putting $32 million into it in uh, the year 2000, then all of this massive value wouldn't have been created. But I guess now that the value has been created, shareholders are saying, stop destroying it. Let's find a way of actually at least maintaining the value that we're at. There's still a massive amount of risk investing in Chinese shares, are there not? Huge. They uh, Again, Sean Pesh has pointed out that there's a, a thing called the VIE structure, which means that it's really a contract between uh, Tencent and uh, the, the shareholders. It's not You don't own the shares in China. Mm. You own it through a contract, which if you imagine if, if China were to attack Taiwan, Taiwan, which they've been saying, and you had American sanctions or sanctions from the West in the same way as we have against Russia, suddenly those VIE structures would be worth a zipper. Would okay. render the, the Chinese shares you have massive exposure to at zip. And we have, as South Africans, about 10% of the equity in every South African retirement portfolio is directly attributable to this. So it's, it's, a, it's a very serious thing for, for this country. Well, from one disaster to another, this time in KwaZulu Natal, um, the president addressed us on, was it Sunday or Monday? I think I can't remember. Um, Cyril Ramaphosa. You can notice I'm, I, I'm glued to the television nowadays Absolutely. with the president, like the rest of South Africa. Yeah. How different from, from those family meetings in the beginning of COVID? <laughs> yeah, people have, people are now <laughs> hot full of those things. Um, so he, he addressed the country. He put us into a national state of disaster. Um, and this is off the back of a provincial state of disaster being declared in KwaZulu-Natal. Now, I'll tell you something interesting, Alec. I've heard rumblings and I've seen a couple of interesting tweets about why the president would decide to put us in a national state of disaster effectively for something that happened in a province. And that is because quite sly is there may have been a large concern over how the funds would have been handled from a provincial perspective in KZN. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you declare a national state of disaster, there is perhaps national oversight over those funds. Um, so that's relevant in this country. Yes, and that's exactly where we're going here. You know, Alec, I can't tell you, I've listened to a, a couple of speeches from heads of state around the world, and I, I can't tell you I've ever heard a head of state tell his population, promise his population, that they're going to do everything they can to not have the taxpayers' money stolen. And, I mean, it's, it's a disgrace that the head of state has to tell the citizens of his country, we're going to do our very best, we've learned our lesson from COVID. I mean, it's an absolute bloody disgrace. Here is a, here is a letter from the Cathrado Foundation. It's entitled, Please Do Not Repeat the COVID-19 Experience, Don't Steal. And there are a couple of lines here. It says, Public resources were stolen under the guise of emergency procurement processes and not used for intended purposes under COVID. Prices were inflated and public funds were not used in a prudent manner. Here's another line that, that caught my attention. South Africans must rally behind reputable relief organizations and efforts being carried out across KZN. What springs to mind is Gift of the Givers. Um, 
and how I wish a portion of our tax money could actually go to organizations that do the job, they do it well, they do it efficiently, and they do it effectively. Um, and this final line, there are likely to be significant public tenders for such reconstruction efforts in KwaZulu-Natal. We know that road infrastructure to the value of about 5.6 billion rand has been damaged. Um, there is a billion rand that's been made immediately available by National Treasury f as, r as emergency relief funds in KZN. And there is going to be a move to, to acquire more funding. Uh, the president saying that they can't, they simply haven't even been able to tally how much the damage is worth at the moment. The Cathrata Foundation says uh, these public tenders, this is where business criminals and looters will be focused on in the hope that they will personally benefit we cannot let the COVID 19 and state capture experience go without learning from it but kwazulu natal's got the construction mafia well, the construction mafia takes 30 percent of every single public tender and i know people in kzn who are working against or trying surreptitiously to address this con uh, corruption, this uh, construction mafia. It's well known in the province that you've got, if you want to tender, the thugs will come along with, uh, with weapons and you have to give them 30%. It's like, a, it's like a racket. So well done to Cyril for making it a national state of disaster, at least that way, some of the... Some purely, of the purely speculation. It's our show, Alec. We're allowed to speculate. I think Makes sense. I think Ramaphosa wants national oversight over those funds. The and so we should have them. Absolutely. Actually. What what I cannot understand is he told the nation, and it's a sign of where we've gotten to and what we've become used to, is he said there I, I guarantee that there will be value for money, that we will not be misusing or misappropriating the funds. And we're going to do it properly this time. You, as the government, should have been doing that from the first rand you take from the taxpayer. There must be value for money and it must not be stolen. Why must we wait for a, a disaster to unfold for you to then come to the nation and tell us what should be, what should be well, second nature? You, you, of, no, you shouldn't be stealing but, the money. But the nation is saying, you're going to steal. This is just another, another uh, 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 opportunity for the governing, for the ANC, which... Helen Ziller calls a criminal syndicate to steal again, to yeah. steal more. And if, if, you, if you are, as the head of state, uh, listening to your constituency and you're having to tell them, no, but this time it's different, it is a parlous state of affairs. But let's hope. Did you see the video of the Batwoman? Uh, the the uh, lady, I think it's from Dur Durban North, who took her car. What happened was the residents of Durban North uh, put a whole we're, we're, we're putting together uh, not not money but uh, aid relief mm, yeah. for the like workers food parcels and so on yeah, yes for the workers who yeah. were the, the the relief workers um, and uh, Itikweni sent a couple of trucks over yeah. to pick this up yeah uh, presumably it's in the way that it's happened before so that the the corrupt people can then pick up the food parcels or the various parcels and the she put her car in front of the vehicles yeah. and stopped them from leaving and uh, and videoed the whole thing she was she was quite crazy about it she but was quite you did you did uh, hear uh, it. quite aggressive in the video you could hear the anger in her voice um, but good for her absolutely. good for those kind absolutely. of citizens yeah. uh, the etik Weni came back later to say oh no it was a terrible misunderstanding and we've given everything back yeah. But what kind of a misunderstanding? Did you hear another uh, misunderstanding? Uh, it was alleged by um, one of the um, associations, residence associations near La Mercy, where Premier Sikhle Zikalala lives, that he had a, a water truck diverted to his personal residence, um, away from those who are begging for water to his personal residence. And when he was confronted with this and the, the ratepayers association, they're saying, what on earth are you doing? This is theft. Um, he said, no, the, the, the images of that water truck outside my residence were doctored. Give me a break. Oh, well, at anyway, least we have an open media in South Africa. We're not Russia or China. We yeah. do have an opportunity here to, to engage. And I'm sure that uh, citizens of this country are, are aware of what's happening. We have the power 
to punish these miscreants who happen to be in political uh, high polit- political positions. And the more that we understand this, the more knowledge we have, then the more we will exercise our vote when the opportunity arises. So let's hope that uh, that that the message is just it is getting through, but hopefully in time for 2024. Well, here is the voice of Cyril Ramaphosa, and please, uh, dear viewer and listener, take comfort from the words from Cyril Ramaphosa. It will be critical as we undertake this work that all the resources we mobilise <clears throat> are used for their intended purposes and reach the intended recipients. There can be no room for corruption. There can be no room for mismanagement or fraud of any sort. Learning from the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're drawing together various stakeholders to be part of an oversight structure to ensure that all funds disbursed to respond to this disaster are properly accounted for. Let's hope that, uh, that stakeholder structure is properly disclosed. Yeah, I, I, I'm, it's going to be various um, instruments of the state. Um, it's, it's going to be uh, the Auditor General and other bodies that I think they also want to get Parliament involved so that there's parliamentary oversight over how this money is spent. Um, hope against hope that, that, you know, South Africans, as I said, hurtful. There were messages of hyenas, images of hyenas, and um, I think this actually came out, f- I don't mean to defame the man, Bantu Olomisa, General Bantu Olomisa, put up the comrades are ready to getting ready for the KZN uh, relief funds. And it's just a bunch of hyenas about to rush a Russia caucus. Uh, but you get the idea. You know, the comrades are ready to, to loot and to, to milk this, this, these relief funds dry. Let's hope that that doesn't happen and that there is enough outrage around something like this so that those little sticky fingers are kept outside of the public purse strings. It's a very interesting point. It will segue into our next discussion on Cape independence because the people of the Western Cape, as Phil Craig from the Cape Independence Advocacy Group keeps reminding us, have never voted the ANC or have never for how many, three elections now, voted the ANC into power there in that the ANC's vote in the Western Cape has continued to decline and yet they are governed by a political party to which they don't agree. And this is what he's saying. He's saying that the Cape needs to be governing itself and the best way to do this is to become a separate country. Now, if you'd said that to me 10 years ago, I'd have, I, would have, uh, I think we would have both laughed and oh, it's, you know, it's a separate com- uh, country. It's not a joking matter anymore. Uh, the process begins in earnest with a referendum, referendum yeah. uh, for the people in the Western Cape, but they're not allowed to have a referendum yet according to uh, the, uh, the laws in Parliament, although according to the Constitution they should be allowed to. So there's a private member's bill which is being held back for reasons best known to the DA who've said that it's, it's a, a very interesting uh, or very well-supported bill. Do we know what the DA stance on this is? They don't support it outright. Uh, the DA is is uh, is on the fence mm. because more than fifty percent of their constituency in the Western Cape are apparently in favour. Something like two thirds of it uh, of their constituency are in favour of Cape independence, and this comes from uh, Gareth van Onselen's research company, which is highly respected. I think it's called Victory, uh, and they've done the research which came up with this conclusion or with these numbers and it makes sense think about it mike you're sitting in the western cape which is extremely well governed you don't have potholes around there you know that your rates relative to other parts of the country are now a lot lower because you're not you're, you're, the pool uh, is not being plundered as we've seen it's been so well documented elsewhere you're being properly managed and yet you are being subjected to an overall uh, overall policies which don't make any sense to you be, from an economic point of view, i.e. you're a free enterprise uh, supporter rather than a socialist, uh, from a, a, a BE point of view. Um, there are many, many uh, knock-on effects on why the people in the Western Cape would want to be uh, captains of their own destiny. 
I, I, I had a chat with Phil Craig today because on Wednesday they are having a march. Now, this is not something that uh, hasn't been done before. Apparently, they had a march in 2020, but it is the first march uh, that they've been able to put together now that COVID is, is, uh, seems to be in the background. And uh, he, he said to me, uh, well, we're in the discussion there, they all meeting on the Grand Parade on, uh, in Cape Town on Wednesday, Freedom Day, which is terribly appropriate if you're a Cape Independence advocacy group uh, protagonist. And I asked him, but but who are the guys who are supporting this? Are you who are your biggest supporters? Is it the people who've been living in the Cape for a long time, or is it those who've semigrated to the Cape? And he had a really interesting answer. The third group of people are actually the most fervent Cape Independent supporters, and they're the people who haven't moved yet but intend to. They are our biggest funders, they are our most vocal supporters, because I think in some ways the people of the Western Cape are slightly spoilt because we're insulated from the, the worst of the failing state by a you know, pretty functional provincial government. Uh, people that have moved here, it's great and they can see the differences, uh, but actually to a certain extent that they've arrived. I think the people who are left in that failing, decaying state want somewhere to go to. I think in many ways those people are the the most active because i think for them it's the most real it's an interesting accent he has he's english yeah he's uh, well like many immigrants i don't know how many as in a brit well that's where he comes from but uh i met a i met a lady from ireland who's been here 35 years and she sounded like she was in the middle of dublin just got off the boat (laughs) what like us when we (laughs) traveled the people in in the uk who are south africans who've been there 30 40 years and they're still the foreigners because they speak like we do so yeah he's a he's 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 an interesting guy and he's Mm. been uh, very active in this role as have others uh, um, around this whole rallying cry but what i found interesting is that it's those of us who live outside of the western cape uh, who are looking at it as maybe the israel of people who want free enterprise business driven uh, uh, country etc and that you could have this first world enclave uh, in the west in uh, in in part of africa I, we've had some interesting discussions in the past and i said but are you going to build a wall like donald trump no you don't have to do that says full Anyway, it's a long way down the line. Well, but there's the, a l- the phenomenon is already known as semigrate, to semigrate to the Western Cape. And rather that than, than emigrate elsewhere, because the minute someone emigrates elsewhere, they become a participant in another economy and paying tax there. At least if the guys are going to the Western Cape, fine, yeah. go and live there. You're paying your taxes to South Africa. If the Western Cape were to become an independent country, yeah. And that would take a, it's quite a process to go through, but he reckons, and, and those who support the idea are very strong, uh, uh, strong believers that it is not only possible, but probable. If that were to happen, then there's going to be quite some debates about, you know, how do you fund it? Oh, how do you fund the rest of South Africa? Yeah, that's interesting. Brexit. It's, it's Cape, obviously what's it? Capes it. Capes it. It's obviously the tourism capital of South Africa. Well, no mining. Yeah, on the first line, and that's what's keeping us going at the moment. So according to, uh, I looked at the stats a couple of years ago, the, the most visited tourist attraction in, in South Africa, number one is the Kruger National Park. Number two was Table Mountain. So it's up there. A lot of international tourism. Money, a lot of, I mean, tur- yeah. it, it's tourist hub. but And beautiful. And, and uh, much massive investment from offshore into, into the Western Cape. We can't, we can't, underestimate how strong uh, the economy is there also in the new world we being in the in the tech field uh, that's the hub michael yeah. Jordan lives in stellenbosch he doesn't live in centurion yeah I, I just don't know how feasible it's going to be but it's feasible economically it's 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 uh now the problem uh, and what Helen do you do what do you do about parliament parliament's there well, actually, long? the ruined, burnt-down building that was Parliament is there. It, it's, uh, it would certainly please many people to mm. move Parliament up to Pretoria. And it is a relic of the past to have... Three uh, it, it, separation. 1910. In 1910, yeah, the, the, 
the, the people from the Western Cape were pacified by saying you would have the parliamentary centre there, then the union buildings would be in Pretoria, the old South African Republic, and the, the Free State has got their... Uh, is it the... Supreme the Court of Appeal, it would be the, the uh, judicial... Judicial uh, ju- capital. Judicial capital. It's just KZN that lost out, but I guess it always does. Jeepers, it does, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Just, just an updated figure on what's going on in KZN. Obviously, the July riots, we had... Um, 50 billion wiped off the books there, uh, and there was uh, 455 people who were, no, it was 545 people. Must double check the numbers there, but just uh, an update the, the death toll from KZN has risen to about 450. Wow. Um, so it's getting close to the right number. People who've lost their lives and, and still several missing, so that number should have gone up. To a very interesting character, um, Alec, you and I both had the pleasure of attending his book launch. Uh, Paul O'Sullivan, CFE. You don't have to ask him. He tells you. He puts it on the cover of his book that is a <laughs> CFE. And Which means? That's a certified forensic examiner. Um, his book is called Stop Me If You Can, and you can't. <laughs> um, Mr. O'Sullivan, never shy to quote himself. What did you make of the book launch? Oh, I, I enjoy, I'm a big fan. He's Paul is a is a national treasure. He he's a force of nature. He just doesn't stop. If you think about who in the world has managed to take on two commissioners of police, one of whom was also the head of Interpol, mm-hmm. and get them charged. Well, the one went to jail. Yeah. The other one is on his way to jail. Well, so, so he says. So he's, yes. well, uh, Patlani is he's he's got a he's got a lot of lot to answer for, and mm. and the case is quite solid. He just he's relentless. He continues to attack the bad guys, uh, despite the fact that he has been uh, been attacked. Uh, or we saw with the book launch. I don't know how many guys you could notice who was this guys who were better built than I was. Looking and slightly, around. slightly heavy on the right side, <laughs> who yeah. were, who were quite happy to hand out some lead poisoning <laughs> were it required in Mister uh, O'Sullivan's parlance, and it's a good book. Uh, I, I haven't have, read it. I, yeah, I, it's I, a good I'd book. Like to. It's 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 one of those books that uh, is going to be used as reference for generations to come. I'm absolutely certain of it because what Paul does is he takes a subject and then researches it very well and then unpacks it in his own words or his own uh, views. But here's a guy who's been thrown into jail on trumped-up charges. His, his, uh, his co-executive uh, director, uh, Sarah Jane Trent, uh, at, at Forensics for Just- Justice, was arrested on trumped-up charges and thrown into jail for the weekend. Yeah. And South African jails are not the place that you want to go and spend weekends in. No. So he's sacrificed huge amounts, and yet he keeps coming back, and he keeps saying, this is the greatest country in the world. This is uh, the hope that is expressed in his book comes through the fact that the bad guys got their comeuppance. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan, and I think um, everybody should have a read. It's, it's uplifting. So he bashed the Zondo Commission, um, as you know, Alec, and... and People may know I, I spent two years um, of my career sitting day in and day out at the Zondo Commission. Um, he didn't have an entirely uh, kind words for the work of um, the now Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, then Deputy Chief Justice. But it's in relation to the fact that there were certain, it's called work streams. It, it is, ESCOM was a work stream, SAA was a work stream, ANN7 was a work stream. It's basically a generalized or a, a distinct topic that an evidence leader who is an advocate is tasked with. You bring all the evidence, all the witnesses, issue all the notices to implicated parties for this particular work stream. Now, the particular work stream that Paul O'Sullivan wanted to testify um, in relation to had to do with the criminal justice system. Now, there were a lot of witnesses who testified in relation to law enforcement, the use of the Secret Service um, slush fund, journalists being paid uh, by the intelligence community. Um, there, were, there was a lot of testimony around that, but Paul O'Sullivan himself, he, 
he wrote up an affidavit. He, he was in London at the time. He sent it through to the commission, and he says it was never used. And he's a little bit upset that he, the requests to cross-examine certain, his words, criminals who testified on the stand, witnesses who gave their version of events, um, he he's a little bit angry that he didn't get a chance, and it would have been him personally, but his legal representatives to to cross examine certain of the quote unquote criminals who testified on the stand in relation to the criminal justice system, which Jacob Zuma or the Zup does, as he put it last night, they were able to significantly capture because you cannot capture a state without capturing the criminal justice system, that which holds people accountable and puts them in jail. You go after um, streams of revenue like ESCOM, um, Transport, Prasa. You go after a host of things. And then the last final w w sort of nail in the coffin would have been Treasury. And thankfully, there were people with spines and those with the, the, um, the wherewithal to, to fight back against that. But here is Mr. O'Sullivan in relation to... well. Um, a very forthright opinion on uh, the Zondo Commission. The Zondo Commission have failed South Africa. They've exposed a lot of state capture. We spent the better part of two and a half years preparing evidence for the Zondo Commission. Volumes and volumes and volumes and witness statements. I stopped what I was doing in London because they urgently needed my sworn statement. That sworn statement was never even used. They've decided that the criminal justice system will no longer be a, a line that they will report on. And I'm flabbergasted because state capture in South Africa would not have been possible without first capturing the criminal justice system. Is he right in that? Absolutely. Absolutely right. If you look at some of the bizarre decisions of um, who was appointed as police commissioners, the head of the, ho the hawks burning in Clemeza, um, whose position through NGOs um, who very successfully fought against the appointment and having it ruled invalid and set aside. Freedom Under Law is, is one um, institutional NGO that very strongly advocated the fight against the appointment of That's a man. Judge Crickler. Yes, mm -hmm. Johan Crickler, yes. And, and they had Burning and Clemeza's appointment set aside. He was a deeply flawed individual who had certain very adverse findings again made against him by by judges and he was appointed as the head of the hawks um and then you he you had paul of sullivan going through uh, the fact that sean abrams was appointed to head up the national prosecuting authority as the ndpp and he says was appointed by mike hulley mike hulley was jacob zuma's uh, advocate who represented him in criminal cases um, so, yes, can you, do you need to capture the criminal justice system of the country? If you look at the history of South Africa and some of the deeply flawed and horrendous appointments within that sphere, absolutely, um, that did happen. And he doesn't seem to be too happy with the status quo um, of with the current National Director of Public Prosecutions, Shamila Batoi, um, and what's going on at the NPA at the yeah, moment. Didn't he say that he'd actually given her a number of names that yeah. he's going to go out after in private prosecutions yes. unless they, they actually prosecute those people? But you've got to ask, why is it taking so long? I remember Operation Car Wash in Brazil. It took them three years. Yeah, from the up, beginning, they locked to, up hundreds of people. Yeah, but they start they, they, the the first of the um, of of the prosecutions began three years after the investigations began. So we got to give them some time. But phew, Operation Car Wash was incredibly successful. Yeah, I was hoping that uh, we'd be. I don't know what the timelines are, but we must be very getting getting very close to that now, where we've got to start seeing some big fish it's, landed. It's resources. Um, its capacity. Remember, the NPA simply prosecutes the cases that they believe are winnable. Mm -hmm. The cases have to be built by law enforcement. That's your, your cops and the DPCI, the, the Hawks. So investigators or the, the, the prosecutors will say, I can't win a case with this. Take the docket back. Go and find me better, more concrete evidence. So, but Surely with Zonda, there's lots of evidence there, no? 
Yes, and Zondo has for a while now been sharing, and when I say Zondo, let's just say the commission has been um, given approval to share all of the evidence with the Hawks and with the National Prosecuting Authority. And that was basically the idea of the, of the ID, um, the investigative directorate um, under Hermione uh, Cronier. She was supposed to work with and prioritize these state capture you cases. You don't read Harry Potter, obviously. Hermione. No, that's not how it's <laughs> pronounced. <laughs> is, it not, is it Hermione? It's Hermi Hermione Cronier. Is that the way? Mm, sorry. I, I only read it and I thought it was Harry Potter's girlfriend or friend, whatever. <laughs> 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 you learn something new every day. Yes. No, it's it's Hermione Cronier. Um it's one of those And names what's happened to her now? What is she? She resigned. Um so there's a new uh, head of the ID. She resigned. The the circumstances around it were not entirely clear or made public. The talk is that she was very unhappy with the amount of resources made available to them to do the task that they were supposed to do, which is to put high profile politicians and scumbags in orange overalls and put them in prison. So what's going to be different with the replacement? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but it's a resource problem, it's a capacity problem, and it's dealing with a, a South African public that has run out of patience with this. Speaking of running out of patience, um, Jacob Zuma, uh, there's a lot of queries um, around whether or not he is ever, ever going to have his day in court. Um, and we have to wait until the 17th of May, which is the holding date there, to find out um, what he's going to do there. If the Supreme Court of Appeal has made a decision yet on having Advocate Billy Downer kicked off as the prosecutor there, um, or and if the SEA doesn't rule in his favor, he's going to take it to the Constitutional Court. So ladies and gentlemen, do not hold your breath to see Jacob Zuma sitting in the dock on a corruption charge. But on a happier note, just to end yeah. off with, uh, the most popular politician in the world at one point was Lula da Silva, the president of Brazil. Yes. And he was sentenced to 12 years in jail after Operation Car Wash there. So there is hope. There yeah. is hope that we might, released, get through, we might get through the treacle. He did, and he might yet be revoted because they uh, they had a rather strange guy that they well, yes. replaced the party with. It's possible, but at least there is some comeuppance. There is some some uh, consequence. And we for so long have been uh, the country of no consequences. And maybe, just maybe, uh, Mr. Zuma will finally get his opportunity, as he keeps telling us, to tell his story and then uh, get the consequences of his actions uh, in in hopefully not escort because it's a bit <laughs> close to home, but perhaps in uh, maybe they reopen Robin Island. He just wants his day in court, Alec. That's all <laughs> he's ever wanted, <laughs> his day in court. It's been good chewing the cud with you for the last hour, Alec. Of course, and uh, and we do it. Next week we're going to take a break, are we? I think we are taking a break yeah. next week. And uh, we'll, so we'll be back in a fortnight with episode five. And uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, who's joined us over these last three weeks. You've encouraged us sufficiently. Uh, with your comments, with your emails, and uh, and with your viewing of uh, our weekly discussion for us to make this a, a permanent fixture. So we look forward to being back in your company in a fortnight. Thanks, everybody.